has freedom, which is itself uncaused, a will. So how can there be one of those? Experience. 
And that, in fact, is its first usefulness. Right? So the idea of a critique says, don't try to deploy these concepts of, of uh, pure reason beyond possible experience. You get into all kinds of antinomies and contradictions and messes about where God is located. But this utility soon becomes positive when we become aware that the principles with which speculative theoretical reason ventures beyond its boundaries do not, in fact, result in extending our use of reason, but rather, if one considers them more closely, inevitably result in narrowing it by threatening to the extent, by threatening to extend the boundaries of sensibility, possible experience, to which these principles really belong beyond everything, and so even to dislodge the pure, the use of pure practical reason. Okay, so there's a really important upshot to limiting theoretical reason, and that is to make room for practical reason. Hence, a critique that limits the speculative use of reason is to be sure to that extent negative. But because it simultaneously removes an obstacle that limits or even threatens to wipe out the use of practical reason, this critique is also, in fact, of positive and very important utility as soon as we have convinced ourselves that there is an absolute necessary practical use of reason, the moral use in which reason unavoidably, in which reason unavoidably extends itself beyond the boundaries of sensibility without needing any assistance from speculative theoretical reason, but in which it must also be made secure against any counteraction from the latter in order not to fall into contradiction with itself. Okay, so what he's saying is that by showing the limits of theoretical reason, like causal knowledge, for example, we, to objects of possible experience, we now open up the possibility, to be sure, not the proof, but the possibility of practical reason. That is, the possibility of deliberating about whether to do one thing or another deliberating about what practical reasons we have for acting one way or another. Kant's thought is, Kant's thought is that when we take up, so let me, let me say one more time, we do not get, we do not get, and we cannot get for a theoretical proof of the existence of a will. We're not going to get a scientific, certainly not we're going to get, we're certainly not going to get an empirical proof of the existence of a will. The thought is that this is something that, if it exists, exists beyond all possible experience. But he thinks, when we deliberate, when we adopt a practical, maybe I'll say first personal point of view, when we're deciding whether to do one thing or another, when we're considering the reasons to do one thing or another, when we adopt the point of view of practical reason, we're already presupposing ourselves to be free. We're already presupposing that we can act on the basis of what we judge to be the better reasons. So when we're deliberating about what to do, we adopt a practical, deliberative point of view, and we consider the reasons why we should do this, or the reasons why we should do that, and we're considering practical reasons, we're already presupposing that those reasons can be effective that we can respond to those reasons, that we can act on the basis of our judgment about what we have reason to do. That's what a deliberative point of view is. That's what it already presupposes. And if theoretical reason were to extend in this unlimited way, that deliberative perspective context would be threatened. Because uh, that deliberative perspective would be in conflict with the idea that everything has a cause. Namely, 
ourselves. So from a deliberative point of view, we assume that we're able to um, act as we judge best, as we judge most reasonable or rational. Okay, um, so last point. We don't know, we don't have theoretical or scientific knowledge that we're free. We don't have theoretical proof that we have free will. But Kant's thought is that the critique of pure reason establishes the possibility of that, even if not the proof of, it, of the existence of a free will. And that's enough for us to show that there's not a contradiction in postulating the possibility of a free will for us to take up a deliberate point of view that presupposes it. So sometimes, last point, so sometimes Kant contrasts two different points of view. Uh, sometimes he talks about two different, I don't like this phrase, but sometimes as if it were two different worlds. So these are the noumenal world or the noumenal objects. These are things as they are in themselves apart from how we experience them. So we can never have theoretical knowledge, certainly not scientific knowledge, of noumenal things. But we have Phenomenal, we have knowledge of phenomenal objects, things as, as we find them in experience. So it's going to be phenomenal objects, not numinal objects, that are in space and time. It's going to be phenomenal events, not numinal events, that are causally determined. So, really the very last point. So we can look at human beings from two different points of view. We can look at human beings as phenomenal objects, in which case they're going to be located in specific places and specific times, and are going to be subject to causal determination. So this is maybe like what you might think of a psychology study, or maybe a neuroscience study, something like that. But we can also look at them as, we can also think of them, we can also think of them as they as objects in themselves, apart from those categories of understanding and forms of uh, forms of intuition. And as numinal beings, they're not located in time and space, and they're not subject to causal determination. And we think of ourselves in that way when we take up a deliberate point. When we take up a deliberation from the use from the point of view of practical reason. When we deploy practical reason, we are thinking of ourselves as numinal objects, not subject to causal. Okay, next time we really will start looking at the text. You should read part at least of part one. We'll finish the uh, preface and get started.